Um, good afternoon, everybody, uh, to all of us who are here in London, and good day to others who are joining us online from around the world. My name is Christina Bennett. I'm the head of the Humanitarian Policy Group um, here at the Overseas Development Institute, um, and I wanted to welcome you to today's event, Breaking the Silence, Promoting Action on Aid Worker Mental Health. And maybe before we get started, a bit about why we're here. Um, so, you know, throughout the year, HPG ODI puts on a lot of events about aid work, the work that we all do in crisis contexts and the crises themselves. But we make sure that once a year um, on World Humanitarian Day, which is this Sunday, August 19th, we actually turn that lens around and focus on the aid workers themselves, what their issues are, what they're concerned with, and in this case, their well-being directly. I mean, as we all know, humanitarian aid workers are routinely subject to traumatic events. And I think we hear a lot about you know, aid workers suffering from, um, you know, from trauma, from PTSD. Um, but having been an aid worker myself, you know, what's talked about a lot less is that kind of chronic churn of stress, of long work hours, of just the, the intensity of a volatile environment, and the burnout, and the, um, the depression, and the anxiety that results from all of that. So we wanted to make sure that today we talked about all of that. Um, and, you know, it's an issue that has been globally getting more and more recognition, but still, as you'll hear from many of our panelists, is not quite there yet in terms of the level of support that we need to be providing our fellow aid workers um, through our institutions, but even, you know, as, as volunteers. Um, you know, uh, volunteers in particular experience sort of different levels of stress in their work um, because they are they are working like like the rest of aid organizations, but they're also usually members of the community that are you know affected by the crisis. So they have almost sort of double layers of stress on them, um, and not necessarily the institutional support around them to provide the duty of care that they need. Um, there was a book put out recently um, by Fiona Dunkley, who um, surveyed um, a, a bunch of aid workers on whether or not they felt that they were adequately supported from a mental health perspective, and only 20% said that they were. So this is obviously, while there's increasing recognition around this, we are not doing a good enough job. Um, and also, you know, in all of our societies, there is this prevailing sense of guilt, um, of um, stigma around mental health. I mean, we talk about it a lot in the UK, and there's a whole mental health summit in October of this year put on by the UK government um, because they want to destigmatize this issue of mental health. And you see, you know, even the royal family getting involved in that. So it's, it's something that also pervades the aid community, that people just don't want to talk about it. And, you know, I was talking to one of the panelists earlier, particularly managers. If you're the head of a country office, you're trying to keep it all together for everybody else, but not necessarily looking after yourself um, in that respect. So. Today we're going to be exploring some of these issues focused on four main questions. Number one, what are the main sources of stress for aid workers and are they preventable? Number two, how do aid workers themselves cope with stress? I think, you know, as a, as a sector, we are pretty resilient. What are some of the ways in which aid workers cope um, without, you know, in the absence of, of institutional responses? Um, and what can we learn from that? Um, third, what progress has been made on supporting aid worker mental health? And I think you'll hear from everybody, we're moving forward on this. Um, so there are some good practices here and there, but perhaps not enough. And then finally, what are the barriers as to why this isn't happening? And we'll go through, um, I think a lot of di different dimensions on that. So to have to have this discussion with us, I'm delighted to introduce our panel. Um, immediately to my right is Jazz O'Hara, who's founder of the Worldwide Tribe, a volunteer organization and online community that seeks to raise awareness about the refugee crisis and supports directly those caught up in it. Um, to my left is Michael Basirku, mm -hmm. uh, who is a former humanitarian aid worker and has worked in 15 different country contexts affected by war and disaster, and who has written about mental health issues and conflict. So he'll be sharing some of his views on that. Um, I have online coming in from uh, Copenhagen, from Denmark, Cecilia Dinesen who is an advisor at the Reference Center for Psycho Psychosocial Support at the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. Um, Cecilia has just developed a toolkit um, for mental health support. No, you haven't? 
You have. <laughs> um, <laughs> we have, not me. <laughs> Sorry, you collectively have, um, for specifically for supporting volunteers in National Red Cross Society. So she's going to talk a little bit to us about that. Um, Cecilia has also written an article in the latest copy of Humanitarian Exchange magazine, Shameless Self-Promotion Here, um, which we just put out on mental health in, um, in humanitarian crises. And finally, um, Christine Williamson, whose 20 years of work in challenging um, environments has led her to the founding of Duty of Care International, who looks at these issues from a kind of sector perspective. So Christine will be putting this all into context for us. Um, so what we'll do is we'll hear from our panel. We'll have a bit of a debate among ourselves, and then we'll turn it over to you. Um, and you know, we didn't manage to get um, current aid workers on this panel today for a, probably a variety of reasons. They're busy. They may not want to talk about this. But if I can encourage anybody who's here in London or anybody who is joining us online who is facing some of these issues currently, if you know you can speak anonymously if you're online, we, we'd love to hear from you and we'd love to hear about the issues that you're dealing with. So please, um, I encourage you to speak up. Um, so uh, just to say that this is being um, videoed, this is a public event, there is a hashtag that is not a target, so please feel free to tweet about it, but please silence your phones otherwise so that we don't get interrupted in the discussion. Okay, should we get started? Um, first, let me turn to Jazz, Jazz O'Hara, founder of the Worldwide Tribe. Um, you know, you and I have had several conversations about the you know issues of stress that you yourself have gone through in terms of the work you started in 2015, um, and those around you, the volunteers that you're currently working with. So, you know, from your personal experience, what are the sources of stress for aid workers now, and particularly, what are the specific issues of volunteers as people who come at this with sort of a less of an institutional experience with it? Please go ahead. Thank you. I thought it was relevant for me really to share a little bit about my story and what I've learned about mental health along that journey um, within this sector. So I actually got involved in the humanitarian sector very much by accident. Um, it was three years ago in 2015 when my family was actually looking to um, foster an unaccompanied minor um, who was most likely going to be coming from the refugee camp in Calais. So a refugee, um, and we didn't know where he would be from at the time, or whether it would be a girl or a boy. We didn't have any information. So I was really looking um, to find out more about the camp and what was happening there. But I wasn't getting the answers that I wanted from mainstream media, because at the time it was, it was quite negative, what we were hearing about the camp, and not very humanising. So I went to the camp to find out more um, with my other brother, and it might be worth mentioning at the time that he was working in advertising. I worked in the fashion industry. We were not involved in the humanitarian sector. Um, and I came home um, very shocked by what I had experienced that first trip and wrote about my experience on my own personal Facebook page, just sharing with my friends and family that we would be going again and that people needed tents and sleeping bags and shoes and things like that. Now, that post um, received a lot of traction of traction. I think it was seen by about 16 million people in the end. It went very, very crazy, very, very quickly for me. And that was the beginning of my my, my introduction into, uh, it, was, it was the beginning of the World Wide Tribe. That's what started it. Um, so after that, we were contacted by thousands and thousands of individuals um, through social media wanting to help, wanting to donate, wanting to get involved. So very quickly, I felt the weight and the responsibility of this, these enthusiastic helpers wanting to do something, um, and equally um, the thousands of people um, who, who needed that help in Calais, who at the time, there was no large NGO working on the ground. Um, and at the time, we didn't meet any other UK volunteers, individual volunteers either. Now, that did change very, very quickly after that. Um, more and more um, independent volunteers started to come to Calais. And we really found ourselves part of this grassroots movement supporting the people on the ground there. But none of us who were there had a background in the humanitarian sector. And when we were doing things like distribution of the clothes and the sleeping bags and the tents that we'd been collecting in the UK and filling warehouses full of, organising things like a, a distribution to get these to the people who needed them on the ground was very difficult and something that was a very quick learning curve for all of us. And I think that all of us as, as individual independent volunteers that were kind of coming together under this umbrella of the Worldwide Tribe 
really struggled with the things that we were very quickly um, exposed to and very, which were very different from what we'd ever experienced previously. For myself personally, I, I noticed that when I would come home um, from Calais that it was difficult to connect with old friends and people that I'd known for a long time because we started to have less and less in common and I think that I had this constant feeling that they didn't, un they didn't understand or when they were speaking about things that we'd always spoken about together, I didn't feel like, I felt like I didn't, I didn't care about that anymore and that I couldn't unsee some of the things that I'd seen and experienced in, in Calais. And the word burnout started to really be thrown around a lot in Calais and used a lot in Calais and I started to hear it more and more amongst the volunteers and at, at first it didn't really seem relevant to me because I, I'd never had any problems with my mental health and compared to the people that we were working with, considering your own well-being and your own situation really didn't come as a priority because you just thought, well, you weren't thinking about yourself when the people that you were working with and meeting seemed to be in a lot more of a difficult situation than you. But more and more long-term volunteers were affected by burnout and they were leaving Calais. And when it came to 2016 and the demolition of the camp in its entirety, not only did that displace the thousands of people that lived there, it also left the hundreds of volunteers who were there by that point without that motivation, that determination, that purpose, that reason to get up every morning. And I think that despite it being a very difficult place to work, the jungle actually provided a lot of people, a lot of volunteers with that purpose. And once it was demolished, that left a lot of people feeling very empty. And I think that a lot of us were not prepared for the trauma that we were, were left with, that we were kind of left, we were left with after the camp was demolished. And in that time, I really started to learn more and more about the processes and procedures within established NGOs and that you weren't kind of dropped in a refugee camp without any training. Um, and I think that they were things that, you know, as a grassroots um, organisation and within that grassroots movement, we didn't do, we didn't have... And for that reason, we got close, very, very close to the people that we were working with. We made friends, we made connections, and especially in the Worldwide Tribe. And that's what really engaged our audience. We were all about these personal human stories and sharing these very, um, as I say, human a human perspective. So for that reason, you know, we, we did get close to people and we, we did really, really make friends. And I think that for me, we then, for that reason, did feel and take on board those stories and that trauma that we were hearing, that we were exposed to in a kind of secondhand trauma. So by the time that um, Calais was, the camp in Calais was demolished, we had teams working in Greece and in Turkey. Um, in Greece, we were working on the mainland, but we were also working in Lesbos, and we had a team working in search and rescue. So the head of that team, Dan, he is an old friend of mine who, he, um, his background was in travel. He was working in travel in, in the UK. And in the summer of 2015, he went out to, um, to, to Greece, to Lesbos, to see what he could do, to see if there was anything that he could do. And he's never left. <laughs> he's still there to this day. He's still in Lesbos. He's found, he found out very quickly that there was a lot that he could do and that there was a lot that needed to be done. And he was involved in the um, shore response, so in bringing boats to shore in that summer of 2015 when, for various reasons, maybe some of the NGOs weren't able to work on the ground there. But Dan didn't have any training or any experience and... 
I will never forget the night that he actually called me to tell me that he'd um, administered CPR to a four-year-old boy who he'd found crushed at the bottom of a sinking boat as it was coming to the shore. And he didn't have that experience, as I say, but he did have a heart and that was all he needed at that time to revive this boy. So three years on, things have come on a long way. The World Wide Drive has come far and uh, we still work very closely with people on the ground. Um, I've just got back from Calais myself this week um, and the situation there is as shocking as ever. But the World Wide Tribe does have many more procedures and processes in place now around the well-being of volunteers. Um, and thankfully, the situation on the ground is changing in many places for the better as well. Uh, we do things like we um, work with Red R for training, and most of us have had a holiday or two. Um, because I think that throughout these last three years, what I've realised first and foremost, that if you're not okay yourself and if you're not helping yourself, then how can you expect to be helping anyone else? Yeah, Thank no, you. Thanks, Jess. Maybe just a follow-up question. What, you know, you went into this kind of blind, right? You, you were Very motivated sure. by compassion and what you saw and or what you didn't see and what you didn't know. You know, knowing what you know now about, about the toll that it's taken on you and your friends, um, you know, both in positive and also negative ways. Would you, how would you do things differently as a volunteer going into these situations? So I think that now when I do go into a situation, I go in differently. Um, I, I kind of visualize a, I have a few kind of visualizations that I use to have some kind of um, boundary that you, you don't cross, which sounds a little bit strange, but it really works for me to not get too personally involved and not get too close um, because to be logical and look at the situation from less of an emotional perspective you need to to be doing that um, so I think that for me I've worked on things that have have, have helped me personally um, and yeah to be able to share that with some of the volunteers that work with us and, and guide them and um, yeah, give, give, administer a bit of advice. Um, I think that that's what I would say. Just be aware to, of your own feelings. Great, thank you. And maybe turning to you, Michael. Um, you come from a very different experience than Jazz in that you've worked for much more, you know, for institutions, UNICEF, mm -hmm. the OSCE, institutions that um, have a long-standing, you know, a long-standing experience working in these contexts um, and that, you know, do or should have policies in place mm -hmm. to mitigate some of what Jazz is talking about. But could you tell us a little bit about your own experience working sure. in conflict zones? You know, you worked for a while in Ukraine, for example, um, and how your experience, you know, was similar or different to what Jazz has explained and, and what you see as, um, you know, you've termed this a mental health crisis mm -hmm. in the humanitarian sector. Why do you see it mm -hmm. that way? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you to the host for having me. Um, it's really great to see an organization like yours taking this uh, issue seriously and advocating about it. And um, I should also give a shout out to uh, British Airways for bringing me here um, <laughs> across eight time zones from the West Coast. Uh, they're a former UNICEF Change for Good partner and uh, really saw the value of this uh, panel and also the advocacy we're going to be doing around it. Interestingly enough, my national flag carrier didn't even answer my email. But anyway, that's another story. Um, it's interesting how we have similar parallels because I uh, came into this um, profession also uh, by accident uh, right after 9-11, email out of the blue really from UNICEF to come to Tajikistan to the border with Afghanistan to deal with the um, uh, crisis there. Um, and that uh, invitation came so quickly that uh, I didn't even realize who was asking me to come, whether it was UNICEF or UNESCO, but finally it all sorted out. And that kicked off, I was in journalism before, it kicked off a 10-year-plus uh, uh, fascinating career in the humanitarian aid industry, both um, as a consultant but also as a staff member. The first staff position I ever got was the, probably the most difficult one for UNICEF, and that was the Occupied Palestinian Territory. Guys in the West Bank. Um, and as you mentioned, I've worked in several other places, including more recently in Eastern Ukraine for the OSC. Um, this is an um, organization based in Vienna, 57 member states. Interesting organization in the sense that uh, for anything to happen whatsoever, it takes uh, 57, um, 57 votes to uh, approve any type of uh, deployment, such as the one in Eastern Ukraine. And it was during that time 
in um, uh, 2014 in July where um, I was on the ground with the OSC and we had the shooting down of MH17 uh, of those 298 victims who make up the more than 10,000 who have died since the conflict began in 2014. Now, for most of my time in the humanitarian aid industry, I've worked as a spokesperson. So you're always advocating, you're always talking to media, and in a way this is um, actually beneficial for someone like me. We do see a lot of uh, distressing, horrific events, but you're always talking almost 24-7 to the media or to donors, so nothing is really left inside of you to fester, and I think that's uh, helped me a lot. And, um, but this issue does come up quite often. I've seen burnout uh, happen right in front of my eyes, especially in places like the West Bank and Gaza. And for that reason, in 2014, I did um, write a piece for CNN that kind of, if, if I could put it this way, raised the alarm bell on the mental health crisis in the aid industry. One of the figures I came up with at the time from the so-called global development professional that work was that 80% of respondents, 80% of the aid workers, said they'd experienced some sort of mental health issue. Um, and that, um, you know, some of them um, said that they've been diagnosed with depression. And I quickly wanted to mention too is that in, when we talk about this entire issue, um, it's very important to point out that I believe that a lot of people don't even know how to diagnose themselves, don't know when they're having signs of depression. And of course, that's the first step in terms of dealing with it. So that needs to be taken into account going forward. But I did say again that this issue needs to, should have triggered alarms, and especially um, when um, you know big forums, for example, the um, First World Humanitarian uh, Summit in Istanbul in 2016. Um, in the closing statement that I looked at, this issue didn't even come up. And um, you know, in the aid business, a big buzzword right now is building back better. In other words, when a disaster happens we should look at all aspects and try and build back better. But when the aid workers are kind of the Humpty Dumpty, if you will, and fall off the wall and get cracked up, you know, they're the ones that need a lot of care and building back better as well. Um, a lot of the work I've done, as you may have gather, gathered, is in emergencies. So they tend to be very different from programmatic work, short term, very intensive. And I can say from my own experience that they're also very, very addictive, uh, despite the intensity, despite the danger. So you do see colleagues hopping from one disaster to another to another, hardly without any break in between. And uh, that, can, that really raises stress levels, doesn't give them any sort of opportunity to take a break. And I think that's something that could easily be instituted by organizations, is that you have to take breaks in between deployments. Um, and um, as I said, I think the most stressful time for me was um, being spokesperson for UNICEF in Gaza and uh, the West Bank. The death and destruction was one thing. Um, we also faced um, a lot of um, delays, a lot of rough treatment, a lot of humiliation going through Israeli uh, checkpoints. But you, you mentioned, people have mentioned national staff. And uh, I remember working in our office in uh, East uh, Jerusalem. And every morning, our national colleagues would come by car from Ramallah. And they would already arrive very, very stressed out because they were delayed at checkpoints. They had to have their documents checked. Some of them weren't even allowed through. So that created a, a kind of stressful uh, environment, too. Um, and also, um, I want to kind of jump ahead forward to um, my time with the OSCE. Um, Again, that was two and a half years or so in Ukraine. And there I actually, um, well, I'm my colleagues, we detected quite a new phenomenon going on. And this is the issue of um, harassment by Russian trolls. There is a time um, during uh, the special monitoring missions um, time in Ukraine, it's still there, that um, Russian trolls would actually pick out individual uh, colleagues, individual observers. Mm -hmm. Um, scrub their LinkedIn profiles, Facebook profiles for whatever information, photographs they could find, and then put it out there on social media. So you can imagine you're working in Donetsk and Luhansk, um, which is Ru uh, Ru Russian back rebel controlled, and then you have this coming out at you. You can imagine the stress uh, that happens and what are you going to do about it. So that's kind of uh, a new phenomenon as well. Um, you know, and that also brings me to, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the impact of technology. Um, 
In my time uh, within the aid industry, I found that um, technology can have its good and bad sides. Um, in fact, I'm working on a book right now on smartphone addiction. And uh, I'm trying to pick out the, the positive sides, but also the kind of negative sides of technology and of smartphones. But I found that um, even during my time, having access to things like WhatsApp, to Skype, brings you closer to family and friends, especially if you're working in very dangerous, uh, isolated areas. It helps you to keep track of what's going on back home. Um, and you know, just you can even go to online forums. If you feel lonely or depressed, you can go to forums where people can help you. But otherwise, on, on the flip side of that, and I, in the process of kind of preparing for this forum, for this round table today, I talked to some of my colleagues in the field, and they say, well, yeah, we love all of that. However, we also feel now we're kind of in this uh, always on environment where even we're on, we're on the field uh, doing interventions that there's uh, an expectation that you're going to reply almost immediately to email. And even if you avoid all of that in the field, because of many reporting requirements by big organizations, um, because of uh, a kind of organizational culture, it's expected that you're going to come home and instead of resting, you're going to answer emails. And I talked to one colleague recently in eastern Ukraine. She said that um, going away for the day, you actually pay for it. You come back and there are 100 emails waiting for you and you're expected to, to answer, uh, answer them all. Um, I should say that um, also, um, you raised this briefly, the, um, when organizations um, commit themselves to reducing stress, to giving uh, staff the tools to deal with stress and depression, I think they also have to look at management. Um, especially in um, UNICEF, where we had a very kind of dispersed, autonomous uh, structure, uh, heads of country offices have a lot of autonomy, they have a lot of authority. They set the organiz organizational culture in their own specific way. And a lot of them are um, workaholics, if I can put it that way. They're, I guess, working hard and saving up for that, I guess, villa in Tuscany down the road after they retire. But they're, um, they're, um, the weight of responsibility on them is very high. They also get stressed out. And oftentimes, I've seen burnout happen there, where they take out um, their, their frustration on uh, international staff, on national colleagues. And um, I've already mentioned how national colleagues, they're kind of, in my books, the unsung heroes of the humanitarian in the, in the aid industry and always often the last to um, get services and, and treatment. So I think um, that needs to be taken in, into account too when organizations look at this, uh, would look at this problem too. Um, finally, um, I think um, that treating um, staff uh, equally when it comes to uh, benefits, when it comes to uh, perks, that sort of thing is very, very important. And in our talk before this session, I, I know we wouldn't um, really name names, but I did want to say that at least in the OSCE, there is, um, I think, a need to uh, provide um, e equal pay for work of equal value. As I mentioned, in the OSC, we, they have a structure where there's 57 member states. So each member state has the right to second staff to a particular um, conflict, say, Eastern Ukraine. But what happens is um, the, the uh, staff or the observers from developed countries do get a full salary, do get the daily subsistence allowance. Whereas those from developing countries, say, Poland or uh, Moldova or uh, Montenegro, they only get their daily allowance. They do not get a salary. So you could be working in a team, say, in Donetsk of 10 people. Half may be getting very good benefits, a very good package, and the others not so much. So I think this is very important um, for, for that organization to deal with. So um, and then um, finally, one more on a, on a personal level as well. There have been times, and especially, for example, in Gaza, where um, I've seen um, very, very close colleagues approach burnout. And as I said in the CNN article, it's not a pretty thing to watch. And it's very, very difficult, even as a close friend or a colleague, to go to someone and say, you know what, you need time off. This is really getting to you. But I think, again, there's this kind of organizational culture, perhaps this uh, machismo, if you will, that um, makes it very, very difficult for people to uh, acknowledge this and to say, yeah, you're right, I'm going to take time off. And on that point, um, again, I was reminded this morning by a colleague who just emailed me at the last minute from an organization I'm not going to uh, name, 
but it is an organization which has very good practices in place. And um, I was told that, um, yeah, I was um, promoted. I just got a new deployment, also in a very stressful place. But my request for three months off to recover, to uh, chill out, uh, to get away from all the stress has been turned down. So again, going from one deployment to another with no break is not a very good thing. Thank Great, you. Michael. Thanks for that. Um, I'm going to turn now to Cecilia. You've just, you know, Michael and, and Jazz have just both painted a picture of, um, you know, of a, a, a sector a sector wide culture that doesn't prioritize the well being of the people that are spending, you know, their time, um, their efforts, you know, at, at great risk to their lives, to their health, um, to work within it. Um, you sit on the institutional side of this. You work for a very large organization made up of you know, many, many staff members, but also very many, many volunteers. Um, and you also work for a sort of a center of excellence in, in trying to deal with these issues. So can you talk a little bit from your side, what do you see are the institutional responsibilities to people like Jazz, to people like Michael, um, for providing that kind of level of support in these tough environments? Um, you know, what are you doing about it? How have you seen that support evolve over the years? And, and what about some of these new, um, these new dynamics? Like Michael mentioned technology and trolling and you know, really adding an, an, an extra burden of stress on people who are trying to do the right thing. Thank you, thank you, Christina. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, thanks for, for handing over the mic to me and, and thank you first of all ODI for arranging this event. I think it's an extremely important topic and, and I'm happy to, to take part in the discussion today. I mean, the brief answer to your question, I think, is really to acknowledge uh, at every level uh, in institutions and organizations that well-being of staff and volunteers is not a luxury that you kind of deal with after the real humanitarian needs are met. It's really something that you we need to prioritize as humanitarian organizations from start to finish and, and also, as Michael mentioned, I mean, also after uh, deployments and missions to, to take that responsibility. So I think that recognition is really the first uh, place to start. Um, uh, and as you mentioned, I'm based in the IRFC Reference Center for Psychosocial Support, which is sort of a sec center of excellence on mental health and psychosocial support. And we have sort of a dual mandate. We both work uh, on the mental health and psychosocial support for, for the affected communities, uh, but also for staff and volunteers on the other side. So it's, it's a, a topic that's really close to, to our mandate and what we do. And what we try and do from our side is to, to, to build the capacity of uh, all the national Red Cross and Red Crescent societies around the world to deal with this issue. Um, I have sort of three uh, main takeaway messages today. Uh, the first, I think, Jazz, you also touched upon this, this issue, but that volunteers are as important to staff when we talk about mental health of humanitarian workers. Uh, and perhaps it's even more important to focus on the volunteers than on the staff. Um, and, and yes, representing the Red Cross, it's, it's probably no surprise that I come with, with this uh, statement, but I think there are really some common factors for, for volunteers, whether you work in, in a migration crisis like, like uh, the Worldwide Tribe or you work in conflict zones or, or natural disasters or epidemic outbreaks. Um, and, and the volunteers, they work in very difficult and complex and often also very dangerous uh, situations. They're often the frontline workers that are on the ground meeting the, the really tough humanitarian needs firsthand and hearing all these stories and, and, and really being there offering, offering their hearts, as you said, uh, Jess. Um, but also, as you mentioned in the beginning, I mean, they're also members of the affected communities themselves often. So they often experience the same type of loss, the same type of risk, the same type of, of, uh, of, of challenges as the people affected. And often this can also put them in a very tricky situation because maybe their family and friends uh, expect to have a uh, some of the help that, that they can provide, some of the food distribution. So, so often they can be put in a, in a very tricky situation, wanting to help everyone, but also being under pressure to help their friends and family. Um, and then I think they work 
I mean, often work very long hours under very challenging uh, conditions, but and also, but but I think with even less clear job descriptions than 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 uh, professional workers and uh, very limited supervision and often very very poor support systems. So I think volunteers are really a, a group that is very much at risk, and it's it's both because of the tasks they perform, but also uh, because of the many of the organizational issues. Uh, so I think we need to take this very seriously. Um, and this brings me to the second point that I think is really important to, to underline as well, is that organizational issues matter. So I think while we talk a lot about these uh, traumatic events that you see and, and these um, stories that you hear and that you take in and that you bring home, I think it's also really some of the things that, that contribute to burnout and, and, and distress in, in volunteers and also staff uh, is these things like unclear roles, limited supervision, uh, lack of acknowledgement, uh, like you mentioned, uh, Michael, this um, inequality be between one group of staff and another group of staff uh, that, uh, that, that get different privileges and, and, and different levels of recognition. Um, and I think this also means that it's not necessarily, I mean, if we recognize that organizational issues matter, I think the first, I mean, the good news is that those we can actually address as, as employers, as uh, humanitarian organizations, they are within our, our, our means to actually address those uh, and that we can do something about it. But it also means that it's not necessarily those we would expect that are most at risk, that actually are most at risk. Um, we... We conducted after the or during the Ebola outbreak in West Africa in 2014-15. We conducted the IFRC conducted um, a survey among all this uh, many of the staff and volunteers in in the three countries involved, and it actually showed that the drivers were at a increased risk of uh, of uh, of having uh, symptoms of, of PTSD. Uh, and actually those involved in, in the burial of deceased, like the so-called safe and dignified burial teams, actually had a comparatively lower risk of PTSD symptoms, uh, which was quite surprising uh, to us because we would expect the opposite. Um, and then how do we explain that? I mean, I think there can be different, uh, different reasons for this, but I think one reason can be that actually the, those who actually went and did the burials, maybe had better protective gear available. And and, uh, and even, I mean, we, even they mentioned stuff like they had water, they had water supplies when going to the field. So even small things like this. Uh, so maybe the role was perceived as more safe, uh, even though it was very, very uh, sort of frontline response. Another explanation could also be that maybe there was more like recognition uh, and, and acknowledgement around being in the in the uh, burial team than being just a driver. So just to say that there is a lot of things at play here, and I think the organizational factors matter, and I think we need to take that serious and need to not only think that it's the role itself, but it's also how we organize the work. And just as a, an example, as a consequence of this um, of the study that we conducted, we've also now started to to try and get stuff like driver like uh, drivers or um, admin staff involved in, in some of the trainings and on volunteer support and and and, uh, and self care strategies that we conduct because we see that they are actually also a, a vulnerable group. Um, and then again, yeah. So this brings me to my the third point I wanted to raise is that we can actually do quite simple and quite cost-effective things to promote uh, the well-being uh, of our staff and volunteers, both before uh, operations and during, but certainly also after. So I think, I mean, some of the things that we recommend is to just simple things like regular team meetings, clear supervision, it was also mentioned before, like training, self-care strategies, training of uh, training of the volunteer managers. So, how do we equip them to actually uh, to to lead their teams, but also maybe to identify the signs and symptoms of stress and and to refer and deal with it. Um, and even just small acts of acknowledgement and recognition can really mean a lot uh, for 
for volunteers working. And I think it's important to keep in mind that, that these things are also important and it's really something that can be done. Of course, we also recommend to the national societies that, you, that we work with that you have a more, that you have a referral system in place. So if you have some severe cases, uh, they should have more specialized uh, care if, the, if they need it. But there's also a lot that can be done. And I think it answers one of your questions, Christina. Is it preventable? I think a lot of it, yes, is preventable if you have better structures and systems in place. Um, but I think even though, I mean, it, 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 on the one hand, it's simple. And then on the other hand, why is it not happening? And I think something that's really important is that we get management at all levels to acknowledge uh, this problem and, and the importance of, of promoting mental health and well-being of staff. Uh, because it needs to, I think, like everything, it needs management support. It needs to be in the budgets. It needs to be in the strategic plans. And it needs to be prioritized in the middle of everything else in a humanitarian crisis. Um, and I think that's really the challenge. And, and uh, and, and where we still have also a lot of way to go. Uh, and, and we see it's definitely in those organizations where management does acknowledge this, it's much easier to implement the systems. Um, and then you also, Christina, you asked a question about like how has it evolved and how do we see it? I think from our side, we see there's definitely been an increased focus on this over the past 10, 15 years. Uh, there's been a number of evaluations, reviews, uh, research conducted, and, and we also try to promote new research on this topic because I think it is important. Um, and I think this has all contributed to acknowledging this issue more. Um, and as you mentioned in the beginning, we have made, I don't know if you can see it, uh, across the on the screen, uh, but we've made this toolkit called uh, the Caring for Volunteers Toolkit, uh, which is um, available on our website for download uh, and which includes some of these small, simple things that you can do before, during and after a big, uh, a big um, response. It's, it's published, uh, I think, five or six years ago, so it's not new, but I think it's definitely relevant. And I think other organizations than Red Cross and Red Crescent can, uh, can, can take and learn from it. Um, yeah, so just to wrap up, I think, I mean, I think we as humanitarian organizations have an obligation and also a responsibility to, to care for our staff and volunteers. And I think it starts from when we recruit people uh, and, and have a proper screening of the people we recruit and, and make sure that we equip them well for the task that they're meant to do. Um, and it's definitely a massive uh, responsibility during humanitarian operations, especially if there's like a, a very uh, stressful um, operation and, and then also afterwards. Thanks very much, Cecilia. Just you no, know, maybe you. to follow up um, on a few things you said. So you know, you're painting this picture for us that there's increasing recognition of the problem. You yourselves have conducted studies, so you know there may be a growing evidence base or at least knowledge base for what's actually happening and who is being affected and why. Um, maybe a growing sense of responsibility on the part of institutions that they have duty of care, um, that they have to provide. Um, their, their staff members and or, or volunteers with some, some level of support before, during, and after. Um, and now, you know, toolkits such as yours um, and practical, practical ways in which this can be done. How do you see the uptake? Um, you, you know, you are, are putting forward some ideas for your national societies to take up. Um, are these ideas being taken up? And if not, why? Um. Yes, definitely they are being taken up by some and, and, and we work, uh, we work in sort of very focused ways with selected national societies to kind of uh, get the management support, uh, develop standard operating procedures on this and implement, look at this standard toolkit and say, what can we use in our context? What worked for us? And then we support the training of volunteer managers and, and of volunteers and, and sort of the rollout of this uh, system. So this is, in, in a very concrete way, how we work with, with the implementation side of this to really promote the uptake. Um, of course, it's not 
every national society that has imp implemented this uh, in, in, in full uh, in full but I think it is gaining increasing traction and and we are um, constantly trying to promote it and we try to also promote that there should never be like a, a uh, program in the Red Cross that doesn't have a component of volunteer care. So we try to sort of promote and, and lobby at, at, at different levels for this. And I think, uh, and especially the psychosocial support programs that we are more involved in, we try to to promote that, that all psychosocial programs should have an element of, of, of care for volunteers. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, no, great. Thank you for that. Um, and now I want to turn to Christine. I want you to sort of zoom out for us a little bit. Um, you know, as you've you found this organization, Duty of Care International, I well, maybe you could talk about why you did that. But um, you know, you've got that kind of sector sector level perspective. Um, you know, what does you've heard now from people who are working at ground level? Um, you know, Ce Cecilia is working at sort of at a policy level and a practice level to try to disseminate some good practice on this. You know what. What, um, what you know, globally across the sector, um, does this does does performance on this issue look like? Um, and you know, are you seeing movements, uh, positive movements, in any direction? Um, and if not, what do you see are the principal challenges or barriers to making this? You know, we've obviously been talking about this mm -hmm. as a major issue, and yet we're having this session because it's obviously not being taken mm. up in the way we all think it should be. So why is that in your mind? Why is that in my mind? Great. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. And thank you. I just want to reiterate what everyone else has said. Thank you for uh, running this um, session on this really important topic, especially today. So thank you. Um, so how is the sector performing on supporting aid workers with their mental health? Uh, I feel a little bit, <laughs> I feel like a spokesman now for the sector. But um, so I think the support for aid workers uh, has improved over the years. Um, and I hate to keep mentioning duty of care, but I think most organizations know it's a duty of care and an obligation to be equally concerned with the psychological health as well as the physical health of their workers. So um, in the eyes of the law, actually they are equal. Um, and I think organizations know that. I just don't know if they know how to address that. I think organizations are now providing services and support much sooner than they were before. I think the mental health of an aid worker is being seen as a health risk, and organizations are using preventative strategies where, uh, that Cecilia's mentioned, that we've all mentioned, um, and looking at ways to ensure their workers are trying to stay healthy. Um, they are using the approach, prevention is better than cure, um, and I think the reason for that, and I think we know that, that perhaps that costs less, um, we have to be financially viable, of course. And whilst this is good news, um, we are going in the right direction in some areas, but I would argue we are still a long way off from where we need to be. Um, I don't think we're going quick enough and far enough. Um, so before I go into where I think we should be, what we should be working on, I just asking, uh, answering your question, where should we improve or where, where are we seeing improvements? Um, and I'm, I mean, just looking to Cecilia and everything that she's talked about, which is fantastic, is pretty much what I'm going to say. So I'm going to be very practical here. I'm going to use a practical perspective. Um, I think organizations are tapping into the increased number of resources available. Um, there is more information. There are more articles, let's say, on this. There are materials. There's the book, as you mentioned, that Fiona has written. Um, I think uh, most agencies are using specialists in the areas of counseling, psychosocial support, and occupational health. I think that's been going on for quite some time. I think more and more we're seeing specialists being used to help raise awareness on mental health issues in organizations through training programs. Uh, we're strengthening our induction programs, and we're getting better at preparing and supporting aid workers before during and after an assignment. Now, I say we're getting better, but I, I think I'm seeing this in some organizations. Some are doing much better than others. So I think organizations are able to provide a lot of resource and support online, as well as face-to-face, -face, and trying to make it available for all categories of staff, including national staff, which is one of the big categories of staff I think that we have been failing over the years. So other examples um, uh, the, where I feel that we are improving on, I think we're doing better at risk assessments um, and mitigation measures. I think thanks to our security management 
colleagues. Um, we're getting a lot better at that. I think we're getting better at contingency planning and how to respond to critical incidents. Um, for me, when I see a critical incident or I see someone with burnout, um, I see that as much more black and white and easy to respond to than someone where they're at the beginning uh, of things, where things are starting to turn for them and they're not, you know, they're starting to take a downward spiral. I don't think that's easy to spot. But again, I think more on the black and white stuff we're getting better at. Um, we're looking at our insurance policies more. Um, I certainly see more, uh, you know, we're seeing included more counselling sessions, for instance, and we're seeing that happening past the employment contract, which I'm really pleased to see. Um, we're providing managers and staff with training on building resilience and managing stress. I think you'll see that as a normal go-to um, in most organizations. Um, I have seen a couple of organizations providing mental health first aider training. Um, I don't know if, if any of you have heard of that. <laughs> um, we're being more diligent with our health checks. Um, I know one or two organizations are conducting resilience assessments, particularly for the higher risk roles. Um, and I'm really pleased to see, and of course, uh, Cecilia has mentioned this as well, that we're conducting well-being surveys. We're trying to understand the health of our workforce. Peer support programs, I'm seeing, mentorship programs. And we do offer lots of benefits. As Michael has mentioned, it's really important to have consistent benefits and benefits that actually meet the need um, of that particular context. So yes, there's lots of areas that we can look in, and as you can see, um, and I, I have an HR background, you'll see it, it, this is there's not just one thing here. This is never an easy answer. Um, so I've given this some thought, and I thought, well, where, where can we do more, and where do we start? Um, so in answer to your question, and I guess it's in answer to those challenges, um, I have five things. Um, of course, all the things I've mentioned before, if we could do those to a high quality and in a systematic way, um, I think we would be a long way uh, towards supporting our staff with their mental health. But um, So I have these five things, and I'm going to start very practically. Um, a lot of organizations provide counseling, um, but I am going to question the quality of this support. Um, and is it sufficient enough for aid workers? And is it good enough um, for those who have suffered a traumatic experience? And does it take into account diversity and culture? And certainly in the UK, um, providing this is a minimum duty of care requirement, so it's something we should be doing. But I think organisations need to ensure the support they are providing is good. And they need to find ways to check it's good. Um, so your employee assistance programme or your counselling service, is it working well? Is it being used? Um, because that's, that's a question mark for me, whether that is the case. Another practical... Um, uh, thing I would suggest, and again, we've all mentioned this, is, is the whole area around training. I'd like to see learn, this learning being put into practice, and I'd like to know if this is actually making the workforce a healthier place. Um, I'd like to see more training and support for managers. I'd like managers to be able to spot signs early on um, of mental health issues. I'd like them to know how to be supportive and provide a supportive environment. Um, I often see managers receive the same support and training as those they manage. Um, and then the reliance is then left on each individual to take this information and training on board, reassess their priorities, and continually strive to adapt in that situation. So for me, a better solution would be to work in community as a team together, facing the battle together, not hiding it, not covering it up, and, and not even, you know, covering it up So, because we're told, um, you know, th there is a stigma. There's this culture of silence around demonstrating stress or anxiety. Um, we don't want to be displaying an image of all is well, which is often our go-to survival behavior. And I was reading, I was reminded myself of a Guardian article written last year um, that said, you know, this combina combination of a lack of support and a culture of silence makes this problem worse. So they're very two very practical things. Um, so I just wanted to move more onto the sort of the strategic side. And, and I have mentioned how some organizations are seeing mental health in terms of risk. 
And whilst this is a good start, and, and I do advocate this, um, if this is all they are doing, I would call this a minimalist strategy. It's, um, it's the minimum you should be doing. I really believe in order to really address mental health issues, I would be approaching it from the other side and ask what does our workforce look like when it has good mental health and take a more optimal and ethical approach. So for instance, um, a healthy workforce could be characterized as a workforce that's engaged, challenged, supported. They know their roles. They know their roles in the team and in the organization. They are engaged with peer support and they are managed well, as we've already talked about. It's diverse. It's treated fairly with respect. Uh, good behaviors are known, bad behaviors are punished and they're sanctions. Low absence. I would like to see healthy organizations characterized by low absence and then a way of supporting people back into work after longer absences. Um, I want to see organizations taking managing stress and building resilience really seriously. I want them to measure the quality of the training and the difference it makes. I think we need to have trust, transparency and accountability in our leadership and in our government system. And I think we need to be aware of how healthy our staff really are. And these things, um, a very typical uh, HR <laughs> uh, response in a way, uh, these are the things that you aren't surprised about. You know, in fact, some of these are very basic things, um, but we should always be looking um, to improve these basics. So if we looked at mental health of our people from this direction, I think we'd be approaching it um, in a much better way, and we were looking at the culture of the health of the organization in a holistic way. And this brings me, and I'm going to repeat again what Cecilia has said, this brings me to my fourth point, which is the significance of each of those things I've mentioned, each of those characteristics, uh, and the priority the organization places on them will depend on who you speak to in your organization. So another area we need to be clearer on is who is responsible for what and who is ultimately responsible for staff well-being. I'm not entirely clear every organization has figured that one out. And then the final one and the fifth area, and I think this is, this is something that I would even class as a starting point, um, is I think we need to truly understand um, our current workforce's state of health. Um, I think only when you know this um, can then you support your staff. You can provide the training and you can do that at the right time. Um, we collect statistics on things like accidents, near misses, absence and turnover, but can we do better on collecting the data on mental health? And uh, no more than importantly today, uh, World Humanitarian Day, they've released statistics on the numbers that we do have. Um, so in 2017, Relief Web uh, published yesterday alone, um, 313 aid workers were victims of violence. 44% of those victims were killed and 91% of those were national staff. What we don't know is what the effects of these traumatic events had on those individuals, the teams, the managers, or the organization's mental health. The sector doesn't have that data. We can't collate that data. It's not easy. So, but can we do that inside our own organizations? Um, I'm not sure if you're aware that uh, UNHCR released a 2016 wellbeing survey. And one of the striking things from this survey is that in individuals were more at risk for mental health outcomes, and they class those as anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, secondary stress, and alcohol misuse, they were more likely to be at risk from mental health issues if you had an effort reward imbalance. So some of the things, again, that Cecilia was talking about, you know, you know, uh, being praised for your work, um, being, you know, ha being challenged in your work, growing in your work you were more likely to suffer from a mental health issue if you had that imbalance than if you had experienced a traumatic situation. So I think that's something to think about. So the question is, do we know the true cost and time spent on psychological health matters? 
Um, I think that statistic could be mind-blowing. Um, I don't think we'd think twice about investing more in health and well-being practices if we really saw the cost. And I truly think if we had better data, we'd be in a better position to ask the right questions, whether we've got that right. So it's not about knowing the answers. It's about, I don't even think we've got the right questions at the moment. So are we doing enough legally and ethically when we think about duty of care? Are we approaching this in the right way? Are we looking at it from risk or are we looking at it from a holistic perspective? And how can we resolve this with the resources we have? So I've, I think we, uh, we become more inventive or creative when we're in a tight spot with our resources. So I think we can find ways around this. And I'm just going to conclude, I mean, we talk about recruitment and retention and ways to find and keep good people. So I would like us to ask, how do we, uh, how do we find and keep a healthy and productive workforce? And I think that's the angle that we, we should be looking at when thinking about mental health. Great, thank you for that, Christine. One, one thing that strikes me, you know, I'm glad you mentioned those aid worker um, attack statistics, because I think when you are working in the field um, and you, you know, hear those statistics in the context in which you're working, you are aware of attacks against aid workers where you are working, you hear these global figures which are, you know, stable if not increasing every year. Um, you know, you, none of, no one here has yet mentioned peer support. And I think even in the, some of the things that you've talked about, you know, it was very much from an institutional perspective about what we should be doing for staff. But what should we be doing for each other? And is that, a, is that an aspect of what you see as a... Yeah. The, um, yeah, so when I, I mean, I'm, like I say, I'm a duty of care specialist in HR, and I do work with psychological health experts. And um, one um, gentleman I work with, he uses a, a phrase um, with psychological health, you need to have a good diet, uh, activity, sleep and connect mm. and the connect piece is uh particularly when you're in uh you know very high stressful environments um you, you the people that you connect with are the ones that you're with um and this is why i'm talking about this is the community that i would be thinking about now of course we've got technology so we've got skype and that is used so much. Um, I see this a lot more now, that people are connecting on Skype and talking. And there are peer support programs that are really working well, um, particularly in the human rights area that I've seen this work well. So I, I would say connecting is probably one of the biggest things that you can do um, in the mental health area. So it just makes you feel um, part of something that you can perhaps feel not part of, particularly when you're outside of your own culture and comfort zone. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a trigger. Um, there are lots of triggers for mental health issues. I, it's not to say that you have a bad day eating and then suddenly you have a, a mental health issue. I think the, 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 the oh, thing... I have those days. Oh, you have those days where, well, you know, we have, a, we have a connection with food, of course, but it's more about the cumulative. We, we, it's very hard to spot cumulative stress. Um, I think we can spot burnout. I think we can see someone when someone's completely got to that point. But the buildup of it, I don't think we spot so well. And again, it was something Michael said, only you, you are better at spotting your signs than anybody else. Um, so I know that if I'm not sleeping very well, it's probably going to have an impact in lots of other areas. So it is those triggers. It's watching those triggers and how you manage them and making sure you've got, well, people around you to help you manage those. So. Thank you. All right, we've, we've talked enough up here. Um, I'd like to now turn it over to all of you. Um, I have some questions already coming in from those online, but I'd like to start here in London with questions from this audience here. Could I ask you to identify yourself, to speak into the microphone so that our online users can um, hear you, um, and then address the question to um, either one or all of the panelists as you ask your question. Thanks. Okay. Um, is that working? Um, hi, I'm Sarah from the International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, thank you very much. It was a really great panel. really enjoyed it. Um, I had two very quick questions. One's um, general for everybody, which um, is how you connect the responsibility of an organization to look after the mental health of its, mental health of its staff versus the mental health of the people that they're working with on, on the ground. So the ICRC is stronger on the latter, I believe, much stronger on the latter, um, although still has, has a way to, to go to be truly comprehensive. Um, but uh, it's very much, I believe, seen as two separate areas. And I'm kind of interested to see whether they should be two separate areas or there should be one 
um, comprehensive approach for both. And then secondly, um, uh, Christine, on your your point about duty of care after the contract is finished. Mm -hmm. um, just talking to colleagues um, about that, uh, it's, it's something that's come up a couple, of, a couple of times, and I wondered what you thought was the best practice, what, what lessons can be learnt for that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Let's take a couple more and then turn back to the panel. Yes, please go ahead down at the other end of the room. That's convenient. Thank Ooh, you. Convenient. Um, hi, I'm Madeline McGiven. I work at HelpAge as the Humanitarian Advocacy Advisor. But I'm kind of also speaking with my old job hat on. Um, I used to work for MIND, the National Mental Health Charity, as Head of Programmes for Workplace Wellbeing. So this is kind of a confluence of two worlds. Um, and my question is kind of linked to the uh, repeated mention of management. Um, and what I found a lot working with range of different employers previously was that everyone said the solution was managers and that included the individuals being managed and it also included the leaders of organisations who said we need to give our managers training and managers need to do a better job of this and actually when you talk about culture change and a shift in the way that a sector sees something what you really also need is leaders and leaders to speak out not only about the importance of this but about their own experiences and when you look at um kind of work that's gone on in the private sector, in banking and in law, you often see that that's triggered by the chief executive or, you know, really senior partners coming out and saying, actually, this happened to me. And so my question is whether or not any of you have any experience of witnessing that. I've worked in and out of this sector for coming up to a decade, and I've never heard it from anyone in the humanitarian sector. And when I was at Mind, um, most of the people we were working with were not from the NGO world at all. So I'd just be interested to see that. And um, just a quick point on data. I think it's uh, true that it's a massive gap. And although they haven't paid me to plug this, um, mine do have a workplace wellbeing index, which organisations can um, can use. And it basically gives you the sort of data that you were referring to at the end there um, in terms of assessing where your organisation is at and, and kind of giving you an action plan for how you can do better. I think something like that across the sector would be amazing. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, maybe one more question here in the room. Yes, please go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Tamara, and I'm sort of speaking more from a perspective of having worked in the field for about 15 years. Um, one thing that I, I guess I would ask um, for reflections on, it's more, more an idea than, than a specific question. Um, to me, because we've, you've spoken a lot about the importance of, um, you know, and how national staff, national volunteers tend to be more ignored in this area. Um, I had a thought around, you know, mental health and conceptions of mental health are in, in some ways really culturally constructed. And I think a lot of the responses and a lot of the response mechanisms that at least that I've seen are very much from, you know, from a European or North American perspective. So, and I know that that, like, that's my background. I know I provide better support to staff and colleagues with a similar background because <coughs> those are the types of triggers I guess I recognize. So I guess just thoughts on that. Great, thanks. And if I could actually add to your question, it's not the same question, but it's similarly referring to local and national staff. This is coming from online, but maybe just to group them a bit. Um, we have a question from Helen, who's online, um, that um, is about, you know, what about our most in need local and national staff and volunteers who tend to be on rolling contracts and who do not benefit from such, such such structured support offered to their expat counterparts. So maybe dovetailing on tomorrow's question, which was more about the style of support. Um, also, what about the differences in status? So maybe we could just group those into one set of questions. Um, can I ask the panel to reflect on those? Cec Cecilia, do you want to start as you are online? Yes, I could do that. Sorry, I, I did have a challenge on, on, on picking up uh, all of the questions, so so sorry if I miss um, miss something. I think on, on the first point, if I got it right, it was about, like, how do we prioritize mental health of uh, affected communities on the one hand vis-a-vis -vis the the staff and volunteers on the, on the other hand. Um, and, and 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 that the first group tends to get the more support. Um, I guess you could approach this this at different level. If you, I mean, at the sort of more policy, uh, advocacy, communication level, uh, we often try to to actually bring in the issue of the volunteers 
um, every time we, I mean, in any occasion we get, so if people say, yeah, mental health is important, we say, remember the staff and volunteers, remember the staff and volunteers. So I think in a way you can, you can use this as a vector to, to raise the, the awareness on staff and volunteers uh, in yeah, policy messaging, etc. So to kind of always have that extra, like in research, well, remember to also conduct research on, on the staff and volunteers. So this is a little bit how we try to approach it. Um, I think on the more on the more practical, like implementation side, I think it's often different people, uh, or different teams in an organization responsible. So, for the when the, for the staff care, it's often the HR departments that's uh, responsible for this, and the department responsible for um, for uh, uh, for meeting the needs on the ground are often the more programs departments, right? Um, and often we see that. And maybe this links a little bit to the local staff and volunteers that especially the volunteers can get a little bit in between. Are they the responsibility of the HR departments or are they the sp responsibility of uh, the programmatic departments? I think there's no w one clear uh, answer to this. I think it depends on the organization and the context, etc. But I think it's important to place that responsibility and be very clear where does the role of, of HR stop vis-a-vis -vis duty of care and where, where does... Uh, where does the, the, the role of, of, of programs uh, departments start? Um, then there was a question on, on the management and, 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 and how to involve management. I think it's, it's true it's at different level. I think senior management is crucial in terms of getting this cultural change, getting it prioritized at a higher level. And, and our experience with this is simply to, to try and, and, and bring it up and bring it up again and explain why it's important and, and, uh, and, and often, I mean, and lobby that way. Um, and the more sort of direct management, it's more, as, as, uh, as Christine also mentioned, it's more actually having the competency um, of, uh, of actually managing, uh, managing the teams. Um, mm. Of, of local and national staff, both from um, a cultural re relevance perspective, mm -hmm. but also from a you know a contractual perspective that they're not necessarily on the types of contracts where they can take a break, um, and not necessarily you know getting getting equal pay or equal status um, in relation to their international mm -hmm. contracts. It, yeah, definitely, and, and I think that's that's exactly why we're working a lot to promote the, the support for volunteers because I think they are uh, more at risk uh, in this sense. So to actually promote uh, promote their, their status and promote the recognition and promote the support systems available. But I guess it's um, in terms of the cultural relevance, I tr think a lot of what, as I mentioned, we try to promote like simple and cost-effective ways that are often very community-based and, and, and locally grounded. So for example, like you mentioned, Christina, uh, promoting peer support systems. Of course, peer-to-peer -peer support can happen organically, but it can also very much be uh, put in place by an organization as a conscious strategy to promote well-being. And I think that's a way that that is really culturally, I mean, more appropriate. So what we are trying to promote is not necessarily that everyone should have, like, access to um, a psychologist uh, from the UK that can provide uh, X number of counseling sessions because it's not necessarily feasible, it's not necessarily uh, affordable, it's not necessarily culturally appropriate, but more that we build protective structures around people and then try to have some referral available for them, for those who need more support. Um, would anybody else on the panel like to comment on any or all of these questions? Um, Christine, there was a question specifically uh, addressed to you on duty of care after contract. Yeah. Um, yes, this is this is something. I guess I was being a little bit devil's advocate here because I actually want to see more of it. Um, duty of care does not end the minute a contract ends, um, and I think organisations are recognising this now. Insurance companies are, are recognising this now. Um, so what we are seeing is this ongoing support, perhaps with counselling and so on, um, particularly after a traumatic incident or a critical incident, let's call it um, maybe a sexual attack, where you're seeing insurance companies 
very happy to continue supporting an individual past their contract. But let's, let's just, let's not take a, a crisis situation. Let's talk about um, someone who's just, you know, suffered with severe stress and had to take a break off work or even had to leave their job. Um, I think an organization has a duty of care towards that person if it can be recognized that the organization had a, a part to play in that. Um, so putting insurance aside, organizations need to find ways of supporting people past their contract in these situations. Um, they do have a duty of care. I mean, it's no different to um, constructive dismissal, you know, months afterwards. Uh, there are laws for this. There are protective laws on discrimination and all sorts of things. So. Legally, organisations do have a responsibility. I just don't know if they see it. Um, and that's why they need to look at it from a different angle and think, well, people leaving the organisation are our ambassadors. Uh, they are, you know, we want people to thrive when they work with us. We want them to thrive when they leave us. Um, and if we can help them do that, we should. Um, there's always a reasonableness around that, of course, with finances. But I think where someone has struggled and the organization is supporting them. I don't think the support should just be cut off immediately as they leave. I think arrangements could be made. So um, I do think there's a duty of care. I think it's, it depends on what it is. I couldn't tell you black and white, it's this, but I think it's something we do have to consider now, particularly around mental health. Did you want to, um, maybe to Christine and also to Michael, since you have both mentioned this issue of management and management responsibility and, and the specific mm. issues around management, um, uh, to help Age's question about, um, you know, the fact that everyone says that management is a solution and what is that? Mm. No, I, I completely agree um, with, uh, with what was said about, you know, hearing a leader's experience. I mean, essentially, they're acting as role models then, aren't they? And that's what we need. We need more role models. Um, but I do think this is a multifaceted approach. Um, I mean, for example, I remember uh, working on a quite a large bullying and harassment situation a few years ago. Um, and rather than just focus on bullying and harassment, we looked at the values of the organization and we rolled out training um, on that. And we made the managers and the leaders have it first. And then they we used the leaders and the managers in the training going forward um, because I think it was their experiences that turned things around. So I think it's a, it's a multifaceted approach to how you deal with all sorts of things in your organization. I think you need role models. I think you need peer support. I think you need good systems and good benefits. I think in all your training, issues of mental health and values should come into it. It should play into everything you do so that your culture, you're taking your culture with you um, instead of it just appearing here and there. Um, I'd like to see it in induction programs. I'd like to see it in recruitment. I'd like people being asked in recruitment what their attitude is towards mental health and risk in the recruitment process. So um, yeah, I think it should start from there. And as we've mentioned, from recruitment to transition. So um, yeah. Michael, do you have any thoughts on this? Sure. Well, I, I was just thinking that um, in all of my time um, in the humanitarian aid industry, I've learned things like um, how to give CPR, how to change the wheel of an armored vehicle, how to assemble a school on the box kit, but never uh, things like how to recognize depression or how to help colleagues, how to mentor. So that goes to tell you something. But um, I also wanted to say that in that survey, online survey that I referred to earlier, the Global Development Pro Professional Network, one of the biggest issues that came up there was the issue of contract work, that people come and go in this industry and there's very little duty of care afterwards. And um, people are pretty much left to deal with stress and other things by themselves. So how do we improve things? I think um, a lot of organizations, a lot of management have sleepwalked their way through this issue. And I think there's also responsibility on donors and seconding countries or states to put pressure on these organizations that they don't need millions to. To put, in, to put in standards and procedures to help prevent things like depression and stress, especially um, when it comes to uh, local national staff and, and to volunteers. Again, I, I think I kind of said this, is that it ha happens that the international staff do seem to get a lot of the attention, a lot of the perks, and national staff and volunteers do not. Um, on that issue, um, it's very important to take into account cultural and language differences. If you ask someone, for example, uh, uh, in Gaza, a Palestinian, to call Geneva or New York and get counseling, I think that would be very difficult for them. I think a lot of um, 
uh, mentors or counselors need to actually be installed at the local or national level. Uh, very, very important uh, for them to be able to relate to somebody. Because again, even in the biggest organizations, um, there's such a stigma, uh, in, a, in a lot of cultures too, uh, such a st stigma to come out and say that I'm depressed or I'm stressed or I'm afraid. Um, and this will become more of an issue. I think someone mentioned the increasing dangers uh, facing humanitarian aid workers. It's kind of becoming like journalism. There's a lot of danger out there. Kidnappings has become the number one kind of method of choice to intimidate organiz aid organizations. In fact, um, if I can just make a quick uh, anecdote, um, during my time with the OSC, we had eight colleagues in two separate teams kidnapped for a month. Six of those 12 colleagues um, we were held in communicado all together. The OSC is very new to having big missions like the one we had in Ukraine, but um, while they were being held, we did get a big team together, including uh, volunteers from the seconding states, and we developed a program of action for when they would be released. And a big part of that was providing them with counseling, giving them time off, not putting pressure on them to come back to work until they felt uh, they were ready. And um, the other thing you have to be careful with is if, even if someone comes back into your organization after a traumatic event, um, I've seen people, put, for example, in the country office or in headquarters, and um, these are people who are hardcore field workers. They don't cope very well there, let me tell you, most of the time. So that also uh, has to be taken into account, too. Great. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe just to get some of the online questions in front of us, um, and maybe turning to Jazz on this. There have been a few questions about culture, and I think all of you have mentioned this question of culture, whether it's because we operate in a sort of machismo type of uh, sector that we're not allowed to admit to being scared or depressed, um, that there, um, you know, th that there's a, a almost a a culture against um, being really systematic in our in our budgeting, in our HR, in our in our attitude to to to, to getting all of these things lined up. Um, um, so there is there are a couple of questions online about you know you've all given us sort of a, a tall order in terms of what needs to change in the sector, um, but at the base of this is probably something about prioritization and culture. How do we change the culture that we have? Um, in order to make the changes that you are, out, are outlining um, in, in what you've said. And maybe, Jazz, I don't know if being new to the sector and having experienced it at a very different level than some of our other panelists, you know, what do you see as being um, one of the blockages in the culture that we have and how to change that? Well, I think, yeah, as you say, I do come from a very different perspective um, because I do think that in this digital age that we're living at the moment, I'm really seeing this shift in the humanitarian sector and how people are kind of self-organising and it is allowing people as individual volunteers, as as individuals, um, to access uh, these areas um, and this sector and actually go and volunteer on the ground. Um, so within that space, um, we are looking at new ways to still support people on a psychosocial level um, and in their mental health um, using those platforms that they are already engaging in. So whether it's groups on Facebook or um, through social media where people can talk to each other and, um, and, and open, have open, honest conversations about what they've experienced, what they're feeling, and in, in a safe environment. Um, I think that's something that we really encourage um, and is a way that we can use the method that we work um, to support people on this um, mental health issue as well. Thanks. Does anybody else have any other thoughts on culture, organizational culture perhaps? That's the big sticking point, it seems. Um, uh, yeah, maybe just a couple of questions um, from online, just to, because they've been waiting here. Um, someone has um, anonymously said, and I will read this. This is essentially a comment about the point on data, that you know we have, you're saying we're getting more and more data. We have a lot of data. There's enough pushes going on to be able to collect more data. But this, this person says, sorry to be such a downer. Um, but having worked in some tough environments and seen the good and bad of organizations, it's all very well and good to say that um, uh, that we, you know, if we have good data, that all, that good organizations will comply. 
Some won't comply and some just don't care and there's nothing to hold them to account bar whistleblowing, which will impact on your future career. Um, I don't. I know of one circumstance um, where someone circulated a well-being survey to HQ staff, but inc completely ignored the field staff. So I think their point being that you know you can have all of the data in the world, but if you don't act on it, if you don't make it a priority to implement what the data says, what good is that data anyway? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I think the two of you mentioned two sources of data that you were working with, and um, and also I don't know if Help Page you want to come in on on some of that too. Um, any ideas on what to say to this person? who's feeling like a Debbie Downer. Um, Cecilia, do you, Cecilia, do you want to start first? Yeah, I can, I can start. Well, I think, I mean, we should never collect data just for the sake of collecting data. And of course, we should have a clear purpose of what we want to do with it. But I do think that well-being service surveys are really important in this regard and I do think that I think also Christine you mentioned something about it previously that if you can actually link it to absenteeism or if you can link it to performance if you can link some of these uh, like perceived support like some of these things to mental health then I think that's also a case to make for the recognition of from management but I think also your previous question about cultural change, I think it also, that also has to come a push from donors and governments. I mean, unfortunately, we know that donors and governments influence the humanitarian, I mean, their say is so important in the humanitarian sector for anything to really kick off as an important trend. And I think if this is really to kick off, they need to come on board as well. Um, I think we are seeing mental health and psychosocial support in general really becoming more and more on the agenda so we could hope that a spin-off from that could be the sort of the, the sort of staff and volunteer perspective. But I think it's, it's, it's really important. And we have sometimes seen that donors say, oh, you always include so much in your budgets about your own volunteers. You should focus more on the communities. We want to help the communities, not your own volunteers. And, and as long as you meet those barriers from the donors, then it's also difficult to, to change the culture. And what would you say, what would you do to get donors to fund mental health, um, better mental health practices within organizations? This is another question from a, an online participant. I think make the case for, for why it's important, link it to some of, I mean, use some of the evidence that's, I think also Christine mentioned, there is, an, there is more and more, uh, or there are more and more articles coming out, uh, scientific articles as well, that kind of support this. So really trying to make the case for why it's important and linking it, I think that's the way forward. Thank you. Um, Christine, do you have anything to say about this question about data and the use of data and then maybe link to that? Mm -hmm. How do we link funding to some of these issues that we need to be improving on? Yeah, yeah the use of data. Um, yeah, you don't want to be in a situation where you're just rolling out surveys for the sake of surveys. Um, you really need to do them well. Um, and I think this comes back to leadership um, and leadership demonstrating how important this is. Um, and. The way, I, the way I see well-being, it comes in at different places on the employment cycle. So, um, yes, your survey might go out and find information, but then it's what you do with it. And you need to demonstrate and hold those to account that have said, the reason we're doing this is because of, and we are going to do this as a result of. Um, sometimes there will be a hundred things that come out of the survey. And it's very overwhelming, but I'll guarantee there's probably three or four that might hit 80% of what you need to do. Um, it's making sure your surveys are run. There's, there's just got to be accountability and transparency when you run these things. I hate to hear that national staff are missed off, you know, from that situation. They have so much to to bring to the table. And there is no excuse now with our technology that you don't reach national staff. So, um, yeah, that's quite sad to hear and the other one on funding mm. um it's demons <laughs> dare i say it's the return on investment isn't it that donors want to see um value you for money. Uh, value for money yes that's the other one um what what they want to see is that the reason why you're doing what you're doing is because in the long run it's going to benefit everybody 
Um, and it comes back to um, what Jazz was saying, you know, put your oxygen mask on first. If you can, dem and I think donors do know this, um, that if you look after your staff, you're more productive, you're, you're more likely to deliver on your projects to a higher quality, higher quality staff, higher quality projects. It just makes sense. So um, you just need to demonstrate it and be better at that. And I think, as Cecilia says, you have to push back on donors that are saying, we're not funding that. And then, you know, what to argue that case. Thank you. And maybe we just have five minutes left. Maybe I'll take one final question here in the room. Um, Hi, my name is Alison Coulter. I'm from Thrive. Um, Thrive is a new organisation providing healthcare training and consultancy to the humanitarian aid sector. Um, we knew many of us used to work for Interhealth, and my experience in the last year is that it's been easy to sell health services, but what we'd really love to do is to go and mend the fences at the top of the cliff that stop people falling off, and we're not having such a good, easy ride doing that. So it's easy to, you know, we have people phoning us up. My inbox is full of them right now saying, please help, please help. But actually when we suggest training or we suggest consultancy, we talk about healthy organizations, creating a plan, we're getting much less traction. And I just love any tips that you can give us. How can we, what can we do differently to help? Because we're passionate about it like you are. Why don't we have a round on that? Um, let's start at this side of the room. Michael, go ahead. Sure. Um, well, a point I wanted to make in terms of uh, instituting good um, practices across an entire organization when it comes to mental health issues is that um, I think there's a structural problem and what I mean by that is in the um, a lot of bigger organizations whether it's UNICEF, WHO or the OSC um, you have a lot of um, circulation of management uh, people run a country office for five, four or five years and then off they go um, even the executive directors uh, move around quite a bit so I think it's very very important to codify best practices. Every country office, for example, in the UNICEF system has a country office handbook. A lot of these best practices have to go into there. It's like having a crisis communications plan. It has to constantly be updated to take into the new kind of discoveries we find, we find in this uh, field. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question directly, but uh, it, just something came to my mind as well about the issue of culture. I know in my uh, <clears throat> homeland of, of Ukraine, you know, we're just getting to the point there where uh, people with physical uh, handicap camps are being taken care of in terms of wheelchair ramps, things like that. But when it comes to mental health issues, uh, no matter how minor or how major they are, that person is usually put in a back room and almost forgotten about. And this is like in households or communities. So a long way to go in a lot of these emerging economies to change the mindset of people that mental health has to be dealt with uh, openly and um, aggressively. Otherwise, um, I really agree with what was said here. The higher quality staff that you have, the higher quality uh, projects will evolve. So that, um, I think, needs to be uh, taken into account. Great, Jazz. Any practical tips for Thrive? I think from our own experience as well, I would say that it's taken us for something to happen to, to realize okay, we need to write that into our procedures, we need to put some training around that, we need to avoid that happening next time. So now we're actually starting to really try to look forward and cover all eventualities before they happen. Um, and it's still, it's, it's a learning curve for us too, to be honest, because yeah, it's being preventative rather than treating uh, afterwards, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, I don't know if I've got anything to add on that at the moment. For us, it's been a learning curve too. Um, but I do think that, again, as we touched upon, you know, we all need to be, this is a challenging space to work in and we all need to be at the top of our game at all times to be effective. Mm. Thanks, Christy. Um, yeah, I mean, just from my own experience, um, you need an advocate inside the organization. Um, it's coming at it as an outsider. Um, I was HR director for one organization. It took me three or four steps at the, um, the board and the directorship to get duty of care. And I had to do it in so many different ways. I mean, it's getting that business case together. Um, what I did find um, in one organization, it was much easier to do is where something has happened, unfortunately. Um, so it's sometimes take, triggered by an event. Um, you, as you know, with the NRC case in 2012, the whole, there was a lot of organizations looking at that. 
that whole area. Um, certainly in one organization I work with, we lost two people, and suddenly that triggers looking at critical incident procedures and bringing in people to look at those. Um, so dare I say, I, I, I'm sorry to say this, and I know it's awful, because prevention is more expensive and not as, it's not as obvious, is it? Um, as something that's happened and it's in front of you and you're fixing it a little bit like a humanitarian response. So um, I would say <laughs> advocate, get an advocate inside the organization and build the business case with them. Cecilia, final words. Yeah, I mean, I agree with what's been said and often it's, uh, we also see that it's a critical event that then sparks this, uh, the acknowledgement that this is actually important. Um, I would say look for this toolkit that we've developed, Caring for Volunteers. I think if you Google that, it should come up. I think there's some very concrete practical tools there that you might um, be able to use. And I guess it's about starting to do like an assessment, what is already in place, uh, what are the actual risks in your organization, and then what are sort of small steps that can be can be taken towards building a, a stronger system uh, for this would be my advice. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody, for this. Um, we're at time. Um, you know, we had a lot of questions online that I didn't get to, so apologies to those of you who are listening in. Um, we had 250 viewers or 250 participants online, so quite a large audience. Maybe just to end with someone who wanted to send us a more positive comment. Um, he has just joined an NGO, and I won't mention who the NGO is. Actually, I don't know if it's a he. Um, and I have a highly deployable role. I was offered support when I joined with screening and follow-up every six months or after long or difficult deployments. This is, however, the first place that I have seen this taken seriously, but I must say I am impressed and happy. Maybe it's just a function of the time I have joined, but other organizations have not had the same emphasis or support mechanisms, so it is possible. Just to leave on that note um, that, you know, if we're moving toward um, more positive responses on this. So I won't try to summarize what was said today. Um, you will be able to watch this video online in a couple of days. Um, but maybe just to say thank you to all of our participants here in London. Thank you to all of you who have joined online. Um, and thank you so much to our panelists for taking the time with us today to explain your situations um, and some of the remedies for making this better. And I think my takeaway of this is, you know, we should be approaching this issue issue not as how to, to mitigate mental health problems in aid work, but how do we create healthy, healthier organizations um, as a better starting place for the work that we do. So thanks to everybody. Um, one last plug. Um, in terms of, um, in, in sort of commemoration of aid workers and World Humanitarian Day, HPG sponsors um, an, uh, a memorial service at Westminster Abbey. Um, there is an even song prayer service and then a laying of roses outside of, of the Abbey um, in commemoration of those who have died in the line of um, humanitarian work. So I encourage all of you to, you know, bear the rain, walk over there. Um, the even song starts at 530 and the rose laying ceremony at 6. So I will be there. Please join me. You don't need a ticket. Just walk in. Thanks very much for joining. Take care.